Welcome everybody. We're going to get started here in just a minute. My name is Mark Carlson, and I, uh, I work on the Kroc Institute team within PRF here at Purdue. Excited to be here for our, um, our, our inaugural um, series, speaking series. Um, just do a little inter introduction with the speakers. So thank you, distinguished alumni and guests and uh, IU alumni. I think there's one, so thank you for being here. At, at Purdue events, the IU thing always gets the, uh, the laugh in the beginning. Um, so we have two distinguished speakers today. Uh, Nathan Fick is the inaugural U.S. Ambassador at Large for Cybersecurity and Digital Policy. So he's the first ever Ambassador for Cybersecurity and Digital Policy out of the U.S. State Department. Uh, prior to joining, he was a tech executive and entrepreneur. He was the CEO of a software firm called Endgame. Uh, from 2012 through its acquisition uh, by Elastic, which is a great uh, company in 2019. Uh, in 2018, he was named by Fast Company Magazine as one of the 100 most creative people in business, which is, can you imagine? That's pretty amazing. And uh, Endgame was selected by Forbes as one of the 100 best cloud companies in the world. Ambassador Fick uh, nearly, spent nearly a decade as an operating partner at Bessemer, which is a, is a uh, great tier one venture capital company in Silicon Valley. And he was the CEO of the Center for New American Security, which is a national security for firm in, uh, in D.C. He was also, thank you for your service, Ambassador, uh, was a Marine uh, in the infantry and reconnaissance. Um, he had two tours of duty, one in Afghanistan and one in, one in Iraq. Um, he also, uh, adding to all of that, authored a book called One Bullet Away, which uh, the New York Times, uh, was on the New York Times bestseller list in the Washington Post uh, Book of the Year and one of the best military, uh, according to the Military Times, best military books of the decade. So great, uh, great read. Ambassador Fick graduated with high honors in classics from uh, Dartmouth College. He had shared with me that, uh, that his freshman year wasn't great, but obviously he, uh, he excelled uh, through the rest of that. He also holds an MPA from the Harvard uh, Kennedy School and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Keith Kroc, uh, my friend of many decades, is the chairman of the Kroc Institute and a co-chair of the Global Tech Security Commission. Uh, he is known for bringing his transformational leadership to the fields of robotics, General Motors, uh, engineering software, e-commerce, education, philanthropy, economic statecraft, uh, and even the way people sign, or as we like to say, the way people docu-sign. Um, Kroc recently served as the Under Secretary of State uh, which was a dream he didn't know he had when he got asked to do that. Um, and it, uh, it really gave a broad perspective on, on how we can uh, help uh, America. Uh, where he led America's economic diplomacy and the development of the U.S. global economic security strategy. He and his team built the Clean Network Alliance uh, to defeat Communist Party's 5G master plan. He spearheaded the largest onshoring in U.S. history, which was TSMC in Arizona, which I believe goes live next year, um, and started with a $13 billion uh, investment. Now it's up to 40. Uh, also architected the $280 billion Chips and Science Act, which originally was to support that, but has become much broader. And um, at his own risk, uh, but uh, he's excited to do it. He was the highest ranking State Department official to visit Taiwan in 41 years and has been back, and I think is going again pretty soon. Prior to public service, uh, Keith was Purdue's chairman of the Board of Trustees for many, many years, um, uh, recruited a, a, a popular figure, Mr. Mitch Daniels, to be the president. Um, he was the international president of the Sigma Chi fraternity, uh, chairman and CEO of DocuSign, as I mentioned, and also Ariba, um, and the youngest ever uh, VP at General Motors, which uh, I worked for him at that time. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the uh, 2000 Ernst & Young National Entrepreneur of the Year, and 2019 received Harvard's uh, Leader of the Year Award. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Fick and Chairman Kroc up to the stage. 
really appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Well, Mark, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, you read it just as we wrote it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Nate, thanks so much for joining me here. It's great to be here, Keith. Thank uh, you. And you, we just got out of the class one, uh, one clean room. We were turning around. Nate's been here for a couple days and uh, seen a lot. And, you know, I remember when Secretary Raimondo and Secretary Blinken came here, and Secretary Blinken goes, uh, Purdue is the greatest human fab he's ever seen. And Secretary Raimondo said, you know, you have the government sector working together, the business sector, sector working together, the univer uh, university academic sector working together, all with students in this area of discipline engineering. That's how it should work. So I guess my first question to you, Nate, is what do you think about Purdue and, and what's going on here? Uh, particularly in your realm and your focus in terms of global uh, tech security. Mm. So first of all, thanks. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm thrilled to be here. I appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting with students and deans and the president and visiting the nuclear reactor and Keith mentioned the clean room. Uh, my grandfather, by the way, uh, got a master's in mechanical engineering here in the late 1930s before going to work at the War Department in Washington. So, um, I told him that's why he's genetically perfected. <laughs> so so my, my tie might not be gold, but it is in spirit. Uh, and look, the, the caliber of the academic enterprise here is incredible. The breadth, the depth, the expertise, uh, the energy, it's, you, it's just palpable, you can just tell. Uh, you can walk around a campus and talk with people and get a good sense of the feel of the place. Um, and and I, I, everything that I've seen here has been, I think, uh, supportive of my boss's judgment that it's the best human fab he's ever seen. Uh, and I think the work the Institute's doing right at the intersection of technology and policy um, is essential right now. I think it's one of the most challenging and defining issues of our era. And uh, I was talking to a few students before I came up here uh, and really do want to encourage everybody out there to spend, spend a little bit of time and energy in public service over the course of your career. Uh, I love that message. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for you boilermakers out there, it, it, it has become abundantly clear that Purdue University is top national security university in America outside uh, the military academies. And I think that's something to be really proud of um, with the cutting edge research um, also, how we, you know, literally take it from uh, these tech sectors, from um, from research to development to application development to corporate formulation to to adoption, um, and, and that represents uh, tremendous continuity. You know, when when Nate became uh, the ambassador, uh, you sent me, and we were talking about uh, this last night at President Monk's house. Tell me about that. one of the nicest letters I've ever gotten, an email, uh, where he talked about um, continuing on all the things that our team did at the State Department, because in essence, that Nate picked up all the technology part of that. And, uh, and you talked about how important continuity of policy is, um, particularly in the government area, and that's critical for our allies. So talk about that. Uh, Nate, the importance, you know, give your perspective on that, the continuity of policy and how strategic that is across administrations. I, I, look, I think it's hard to get anything of enduring value done quickly. Uh, relationships between countries are kind of like relationships between people. They are trust-based and the good ones are long-term. And our allies and partners around the world need to know that the United States is consistent, that the United States is reliable, uh, that the United States will be there with them on their worst day. And um, that doesn't work if we're swinging the wheel 90 degrees in our policies every two years or every four years or every eight years. So we need to identify some areas, themes, where we have broad shared mm -hmm. consensus that something's really important and then we need to stick with it. And I think in this area of tech diplomacy over the last 
you know, almost decade, mm -hmm. that's largely been the case. Mm -hmm. It really has. And, you know, this epic struggle between uh, freedom and authoritarian regimes, that's probably the, the uh, particularly in the, uh, with regard to China, that's the biggest unifying issue on Capitol Hill. And, uh, uh, and we're seeing a lot of things play out right now in terms of Iran and Russia and, uh, and China. So talk a little bit uh, more about uh, tech diplomacy. You recently uh, created a ward at the State Department uh, in the area of tech diplomacy. At the Kroc Institute, uh, we define the practice of tech diplomacy as the integration of technology expertise, uh, high-tech strategies, Silicon Valley strategies, with foreign policy tools based upon uh, a trust doctor that uh, is really about uh, democratic values. And um, you, you, you run that at the State Department. Give, give us your perspective on, on tech diplomacy and some of the key things you're doing. So you mentioned the award, thank you. What, what Keith is too modest to mention is that its full name is the Keith J. Kroc Award for Excellence in Tech Diplomacy. So um, uh, this man really pioneered the discipline uh, and has a lot of fans, uh, not only at the State Department, but across our partners and allies. Uh, and so thank you uh, for your continued support. Uh, and let me say a word about the award because it's actually emblematic of some things we're trying to do. Uh, in addition to ensuring a strong foreign policy out in the world in these areas, we need to build the institutional capacity inside our own government. Uh, that may, in fact, be the most important thing mm -hmm. we do, uh, because that will outlast uh, any one or two or 20 of us um, who, who are in leadership roles right. in this area. So we're doing a bunch of things. We uh, set the goal of putting a trained technology diplomat in every U.S. mission around the world by the end of next year. So every American embassy around the world will have someone in it, um, a, a, usually a foreign service officer, who will be uh, in charge of this portfolio and will have an understanding of its intricacies. Uh, we have established the award. Every member of our foreign service, civil service, all of our locally employed staff all around the world, and those are the bulk, actually, of our team in, at embassies around the world, they're all eligible for it. We've just gone through the evaluation process for the very first inaugural awardee. I'll tell you what, it's exciting to read dozens and dozens of uh, nominations from ambassadors and others around the world of people on their team who did something awesome in this area to advance the security and the prosperity of the United States. So uh, that award is an effort to elevate the portfolio and get people to want to work on it. Um, and we've done a bunch of other things to institutionalize it. And all of that is so that we can project and, and strengthen a strong U.S. foreign policy in this area. And, and here's the overarching rationale in my view. I would make the argument that tech innovation as a source of national power or coalition power today sits on the same layer as factors like geography or demography or natural resources. It's not on the same layer as traditional measures of strength like GDP or military capacity. Those things are actually downstream of tech innovation. So tech innovation is increasingly foundational. Mm -hmm. You can't practice any kind of foreign policy, nothing bilaterally, multilaterally, nothing functional from climate to human rights to arms control without tech being a part of it. And so we need to mainstream this now. Uh, we're working to mainstream it across every aspect of our foreign policy. And you do so much to safeguard a lot of those things because the reality we face as a nation, as a free world, is ever increasing cyber uh, uh, warfare, uh, technological competition, uh, and our rivals are playing the long game, and playing for keeps, right? They're playing a four dimensional game, a diplomatic, economic, military, and cultural chess, but the crossroads is technology, right? And so that focus there is absolutely key. You know, I want to go back to something that you said in your Senate confirmation hearing, and I've got a quote where you said, we are in a global contest for a democratic future in which we can all use technology to reach our full potential. 
and against an authoritarian future in which technology is harnessed to repress free expression and destabilize open and democratic society. Now, that aligns with the North Star at the Kroc Institute, which is technology must advance freedom. Um, tell us, what are some of the areas where you're seeing threats um, from authoritarian regimes with regard to technology, Nate? So uh, I think if you, if you spin the globe, uh, we could have a conversation about just about any, any, any part of it. Um, I'll, I'll give you a few. So the overarching one in, in this domain uh, is one that you know well and help define, and that is uh, a competition with uh, the, the People's Republic of China, particularly with the CCP, on uh, defining the terms of our technology future. Tech is interwoven with every aspect of our lives. Obviously, it's how our kids learn, it's how our parents access healthcare, it's changing how we work, where we live, everything. Uh, we in the United States and our rights respecting allies and partners have a different view of the role that technology should play in our future. Uh, the Chinese government takes a much more authoritarian, top-down uh, view of, of what that tech ought to look like, how it should be developed, how it should be deployed, how it should be used. And everything from uh, uh, facial recognition uh, to weapon systems to the responsible use of AI, to synthetic biology, across the whole suite of these technologies. Uh, so that, that really is sort of the overarching frame right. of, of competition. Now, there's a little bit of nuance there too, which is, um, yeah, I, I have two daughters in middle school walking in and pounding my hand on the table and saying it's my way or the highway is not an effective parenting strategy, it's also generally not an effective diplomatic strategy. So it's actually incumbent on us, I think, in the United States, uh, who have nurtured and developed the world's leading innovation economy and leading tech ecosystem, uh, it's incumbent upon us not just to be anti-something, but we've got to be for something. Mm -hmm. We have to tell a positive, affirmative, mm -hmm. inclusive story, have a vision for what this technology future can look like. Right. You know, it's interesting because of my Senate confirmation hearing, I was asked by Senator Coons, what would be my strategy to combat China's techno-economic competition? And I said I would harness U.S.'s three biggest areas of competitive advantage by rallying and unifying our allies and our partners. The second is leveraging the innovation, the resources, of the private sector, huge delta there. And the third, to get to your point, is to amplify the moral high ground of democratic trust principles. So one of those things along the lines you're talking about is we develop the trust doctrine, which basically defines uh, uh, those democratic principles that make up trust, that defines trusted technology. Things like transparency, accountability, reciprocity, respect for rule of law, respect for the environment, respect for property of all kinds, respect for human rights, respect for sovereignty of nations. Um, and that is opposed to uh, authoritarian regimes with what we call uh, the domination doctrine, which is concealment, co-option, coercion, intimidation, retaliation, retribution. Because those things we call democratic principles are so many times that those authoritarian regimes use it against us for their own strategic advantage. And what ended up happening with the clean network, we took that uh, uh, trust doctrine and we flipped it on its head. So we, in essence, did a jujitsu move and maintained the moral high ground. We basically weaponized the very principles that protect our freedoms. Um, and so, you know, talk about how important that all of society is and, and leveraging the private sector. Because we've got a lot of private sector folks here. And what, what are some of the things that we can do to yeah. help you out? So look, it's, it's, it's not the 1960s, right? Uh, when the, the moon race uh, and government R&D really spurred tech innovation that kind of trickled down into the private sector. The, the world's inverted now. So, the, the balance of the talent, the balance of the innovation, the balance of the R&D uh, 
you know, the tech development itself, the attack surface we care about protecting, it's all sitting in the private sector, uh, almost all sitting in the private sector. It's my background, it was your background before you came to the State Department. And, uh, and it's the great, I think it's our, our great kind of North Star defining strength in, in the United States. Uh, back to that point about uh, tech innovation being the wellspring of so much of our strength uh, as, a, as a nation and really being kind of the muscle behind our ideals. Um, so we use, we adopt uh, what, what we call a multi-stakeholder approach to, um, uh, again, d developing, deploying, using technology. Multi-stakeholder in government terms and multilateral means state to state. So government to government. Multi-stakeholder is state to state, but also companies, civil society organizations, uh, who often are the reservoirs of great expertise, who are sort of the, the watchdogs who keep everybody uh, honest in the sense of shining a light on things, ensuring transparency. These are principles that are embedded in our rights respecting, uh, generally the, the American um, Western or democratic view of, of tech development, deployment, and use. So to answer your question specifically, though, what do we need from the private sector? And I joke sometimes, when I was uh, building a cybersecurity software business and I would get called into a government meeting uh, to talk about public-private partnership, that usually meant me giving the government, or being compelled to give the government some data, the data getting classified and me getting nothing back, and that didn't feel like much of a partnership. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I think that that has, in many ways, now really fundamentally changed for the better. A uh, bunch of concrete examples of it. Uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine has, has uh, you know, cast a dark cloud over the world, of course, and at the same time has dramatically improved and accelerated our collaboration on a bunch of tech fronts. Uh, so, look, we need that kind of partnership with private enterprise. Uh, we need public-minded business executives who care about the common good, who care about the country. Uh, and we need people in government who have commercial sensibility, uh, who understand how businesses operate, how they make decisions. So, you know, the revolving door gets, gets criticized. And, and I know that there are uh, negative aspects that we need to combat. But look, at the end of the day, we need citizens. We need government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Mm -hmm. And that means citizens willing to serve. Uh, people who develop expertise in the private sector and technology yeah. and are willing to come into government. I mean, the thing that I learned is democracy requires participation. That's right. And a lot of the things that we learned in the private sector uh, is a superpower in government. You know, in Silicon Valley, we practice economic warcraft. It's all about being the category king. Players number two, three, four, five, you know, they fight over the scraps, but we play uh, by Biden, by the rules, because if you don't have your integrity, you don't have anything. But that really is a superpower, because they don't teach that in the Commerce Department, State Department, DOD, Treasury, Trade. So that's an important part of it. And that continuity uh, and, and, and the all-society efforts key. So one of the things that we've been asked to do at the Kroc Institute is to lead the Global Tech Security Commission. And this is a unique commission. It's an international commission. It's comprised of about 50 commissioners, uh, country commissioners with our top technological allies. For example, uh, Tony Abbott, former prime minister of Australia, is the Australian commissioner. And then we have commissioners in the tech sector and strategy commissioners. Um, and uh, one of the key initiatives is to build uh, the global trusted tech network comprised of nations, uh, companies, uh, universities, associations, civil society, and most of all, leaders, um, to really take that pledge. Because if there's anything we learned by building that clean network uh, uh, alliance of democracy, we had 60 countries, 200 telcos, is that it provides a, a security blanket for China's intimidation, retaliation, retribution. And there's strength in numbers, and there's power and unity and solidarity. So talk a little bit about solidarity, some of those things, and, and, and also, uh, by the way, uh, and, and, and Secretary Blinken, Jeannie Raimondo, uh, uh, Kurt Campbell, being great supporters of the, of the commission, and, and, yeah. and, and uh, so have you. We'd love to have you as an honorary uh, co-chair. You know, we've got 14 
uh, members of Congress, Democrat and Republican, both sides. Um, and uh, what are the things that we can, we can do? Yeah, uh, thanks for using the word solidarity. I actually think that is, that is the right word. Um, and, and it's kind of a term of art in the tech diplomatic world because its counterpoint is sovereignty. And so, look, sovereignty is a good thing, right? We, we, we spend a lot of money on our military and other things in order to defend our sovereignty. But in the tech space, sovereignty can become synonymous with things like data localization. Uh, it can become synonymous with a mindset that, hey, we're going to go it alone. Uh, very hard to go it alone in this area. And uh, so I, I think the right mindset, Keith, is, is the one you described, which is one of solidarity. I'll give you an example. Uh, if we were sitting up here 30 years ago, in 1993, the uh, democratic world, the United States, a handful of others, France, Sweden, Finland, Japan, South Korea, Fran uh, I mentioned France, together we had a rich ecosystem of telecom uh, equipment uh, manufacturers. Yep. Companies like not only Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, but also uh, Qualcomm, Motorola, Bell Labs, Alcatel, Lucent, you know, a, a lot of companies yep. that were building trusted telecom hardware. Uh, many of those companies are now gone. The ones that remain are, are not as strong as they used to be. Nokia, announced, you know, they, they had uh, announced earnings this morning, um, including a significant restructuring, laying off 14,000 people. I mean, the, these businesses are under pressure. Why? Because Huawei, a uh, Chinese company, after years of state-sanctioned IP theft uh, and on the back of, of subsidies from uh, the PRC has run the table in many places around the world, particularly uh, in developing economies. And uh, that unfair competition has compressed R&D budgets in the trusted companies and, and gotten us into the position mm -hmm. we're in. So, you know, I, I often joke, I'm, I'm Ericsson and Nokia and, and Samsung's unpaid sales guy. I travel around the world right. trying to do deals not for an American company, but for a Korean company, a Swedish company, right. a Finnish company. And that's solidarity. That is, that is solidarity. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, back in 2020, in another industry, in the semiconductor industry, we looked around. And because we were fighting that 5G fight, we know the most important industry is semiconductors. And there was not one company in the world that was going to build a manufacturing plant in the United States. And we talked to the CEO of Intel. It was Bob Swan at the time. We talked to Samsung. We talked to Micron. We couldn't get anybody to come. And then we said, well, let's go after TSMC. And we did that onshoring, uh, which was the catalyst for that. Uh, 300, uh, uh, $280 billion bipartisan uh, CHIPS Act. And we had already uh, talked to Senator Young and Senator Schumer on the science part. There's $200 billion in R&D for uh, research for the key uh, tech sectors. And, um, and since, that, uh, since that onshoring, now $350 billion of investment has been been announced or started in the United States. And that, that is absolutely critical. And uh, you know, also in that uh, Chips and Science Act, there's a, there's a good slug in there for the State Department um, for uh, investments with other nations in terms of trusted technology. So talk a little bit about, um, about that and where you see the opportunities where State yeah. Department can invest, because we architect, we made sure State Department got some money. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Talk about continuity across administrations. Uh, I think that, let me take half a step back. So um, CHIPS is part of what I would argue is a broader, almost generational realignment that's happening. Uh, we're, we're at the end of a 40 or 50 year period where global supply chains were built and optimized basically for one variable, cost. Uh, the fragility of that system became starkly clear. Uh, geopolitically, it became starkly, starkly clear during uh, the COVID years. And so those global supply chains now are being rewired. And they're being rewired with more than cost as a variable to consider. We have to think about security, resilience, quality. Uh, it's a multivariable yeah. kind of uh, realignment. And 
Uh, it's going to require significant amount, I think, of government incentive. Yep. Uh, companies get it. They see it. Uh, they're doing it. And um, to, to your point, Keith, an element of that and, and the funding, government funding that comes with it, um, is for State Department work to develop, deploy, and defend trusted networks. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the, the telecom infrastructure piece, the communications infrastructure piece, and the realignment of all of this critical manufacturing and these supply chains are, are integrally connected. Right. So, uh, you know, it turns out the internet really is kind of a series of tubes. <laughs> You've got uh, undersea cable and fiber. You have uh, wireless networks for the last couple of miles of connectivity. You've got data centers as things increasingly virtualized. And all of those need to be trusted if all you're doing is cybersecurity on top of fundamentally untrusted architectures, all you're doing is guaranteeing the integrity of those data packets as they flow back to our adversary and competitor yep. capitals. So the two things are tightly connected. Yep. By the way, I want to be your human exclamation point on this because for those of you who don't understand, this company is referring to Huawei is the most important company to China. And they are the backbone of the surveillance state. And they enable the genocide that's going on in Xinjiang. And then you have all these uh, um, things coming off of it, things like uh, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu in the cloud area, who, who are the three most important companies to China's military AI program. You have things like TikTok coming up. You have underwater cable. You have the carriers. Um, and that's one of the things we did. We expanded that uh, uh, clean network to clean cloud, clean cable, clean, uh, clean store, um, uh, clean app. And that clean store was named also after TikTok. And I know that uh, uh, you know, you've been involved in terms of this issue around that. That's getting a lot of press. Um, you know, I always say, if the Chinese can weaponize a balloon, can you imagine what they can do with 150 million TikTok users at their mercy, right? And so give us your perspective on, uh, on, on TikTok. And now it, it just got banned, total ban, in the state of Montana, not just at the state level. I testified in that. And, I, and we think that that might spread to different states. What, what, you know, how do you look at it from your perspective? So... President Biden signed legislation uh, about a year ago banning TikTok from U.S. federal government-owned devices. Uh, and um, I, uh, I think that that is a strong statement of uh, the, the U.S. government's assessment of uh, potential risk associated with TikTok. Uh, other, other, uh, any other action is going to be the result of, uh, of a legislative process that, that I won't try to get ahead of. Um, I will say on a personal note, I am probably the least popular father in my daughter's <laughs> middle school uh, because, uh, because of my views on this one. You know, uh, I've got 12-year-old twins, and I don't let them near it, right? So I'm the same as you. Um, and, you know, what I've said, like, what I get asked this question on, television. TikTok is disguised as candy, but it's really cocaine. And that algorithm they use uh, here in the United States for TikTok, they use it for a totally, it's banned in China. They use the algorithm to promote STEM education. A lot of people don't realize that. Also, a lot of people don't realize that, uh, let's say you don't care about your personal data, your, um, your health records, anything like that. Well, if if, if, if you're a user of TikTok, they can get at anybody who you digitally interact with, your friends, your business associates, all that. In essence, it is a digital virus. And uh, I, I think the only vaccine is a total ban. So, um, and, and there's a lot of other uh, Chinese companies out there that are like that. Uh, let me ask you this one. Um, uh, so uh, back to the private sector. So about a year ago, I penned an article in Fortune magazine that said, present your China contingency plan at the next board meeting. And this was after you know, 300 companies had to pull out of, 
uh, uh, Russia, or of Russia because of Putin's bloody invasion of Ukraine, they lost hundreds of billions. Now with General Secretary Xi's uh, amped up aggression after the private sector, uh, raiding American companies, what's going on in the real estate market over there, their economy, it's a significant risk. And so my message was, you know, as a board member, your fiduciary duty to your shareholders is to mitigate risk. And, you know, just like, you know, you always have a, uh, a plan on a shelf for if you have a cyber breach, uh, you need a plan on the shelf for if something happens with regard to uh, uh, China. And, it, it, you know, it's 30 to 40 times X of, uh, of Russia. And, you know, I see a lot of these boards where it's like, it's just such a big issue, they don't even want to talk about it. Um, so after we penned that thing, uh, we got a lot of uh, calls and emails from board members and CEOs saying, do you have a sample China contingency plan? There's a checklist. So we're about ready to publish that. So tell us, from your perspective, how important is it that this gets discussed at the board level? What, are the, what would be some of your key messages uh, to board members around the world yeah. uh, that, that do business within and for China? So I, I was a public company director um, before coming into government. Um, and er, much earlier in, in my career, um, I, I served in the military before, on, and after 9-11. And so when the 9-11 Commission report was finally released, I read it avidly uh, to try to understand this event that had so shaped my life. And the line that stood out to me in that report more than any other was the one that attributed American vulnerability to that attack to failures of imagination. Failures of imagination. And I think that if you're, when you're in roles like the one I'm in now, the one you were in, Keith, positions of public trust, your, your job really is to worry about five out of every three things, right? Uh, kind of got to worry about everything you can imagine and then think beyond that frontier. Because the thing, the, the unacceptable failure to the American people is a failure of imagination. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I read your piece and applauded it when it came out because uh, public company directors are fiduciaries. Uh, they're in positions that are analogous in a way uh, to, to their shareholders in the way that we are to right. citizens. And uh, this is not an unimaginable risk and therefore it's something that boards have an obligation to think about. I think the, the last 10 days have illustrated starkly uh, in the Middle East how quickly uh, geopolitical circumstances can, can, can change, can shift. History tells us that that's not an aberration, that's actually the norm. Uh, things happen quickly, uh, they accelerate, they go beyond the bounds of our uh, conventional thinking uh, very, very quickly. And so I, I thought that piece was, was absolutely on target. Thanks. Uh, it, I'll tell you, it's got a lot of attention. So it'll be interesting to see what happens out there. You know, based upon what you just said, um, um, Mark talked about uh, my trip to Taiwan and how we um, created the economic, Lee Economic Prosperity Partnership, which you, you guys have continued on. Um, and I was just back there, and on behalf of the Kroc Institute, presented President Tsai with our uh, 2023 Tech Freedom Award for all the things that she's done, uh, not just for Taiwan, but for the world, because Taiwan is really a linchpin of democracy and a, and a role model, not just in the region, but around, around the world. And, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the risk Taiwan is in with uh, China's rhetoric these days, um, and you and I both know their Minister of Digital Affairs, Audrey Tong, who's an amazing uh, woman. She's actually uh, the Taiwan Commissioner on the Global Tech uh, Security Commission. She's also chairing another initiative we have at the Kroc Institute, and that is to develop uh, global trusted tech standards. She has a perfect IQ, by the way, and she, she never goes to bed without all her email being cleared. Now that's a goal, I'm telling you. Um, she is amazing. Um, and so, uh, what are some of the things, you know, from your perspective, 
that all of us uh, can do for Taiwan because, yeah. you know, these are courageous people and, and uh, you know, they look, they saw what happened in Hong Kong. They see what's going on in Xinjiang. They see obviously what's going on in Ukraine. And, um, you know, when I see through my 12 year old eyes, when they see that stuff, they realize that freedom is worth fighting for. So what do you think? Yeah, a, a, maybe a few observations here. Uh, first of all, yes, uh, Audrey Tang is impressive. And one of the gratifying things in, in uh, this job or any job is when you meet a counterpart who is so clearly the right person in the right role at the right time, she's in that category. Yeah. Um, and and we, we're in frequent dialogue on a whole range of things. Um, I think that it, ra rather than comment uh, maybe too directly and specifically on Taiwan, I, I would make the point that uh, one, of the, one of the ways of thinking that we need to be sensitive to is uh, learning the lessons, le learning applicable lessons uh, elsewhere in the world and then trying to accelerate their adoption uh, in, in areas where you know, you can imagine, back to failure, no failures of imagination, you can imagine some analogous future right. events. So um, I mentioned Taiwan and public-private collaboration. Let me, let me go just a layer deeper on that and highlight three things that, uh, that the U.S. government, uh, uh, U.S. companies, and the Ukrainian government had, have done uh, t together. Uh, did I? Yeah, I said the invasion of Ukraine. Um, First was migration of the Ukrainian government enterprise to the cloud. That allowed the Ukrainian government to continue communicating, planning, coordinating, providing services to citizens, even as its infrastructure was right. reduced to smoking piles of metal, right. right? So that was really important. The second thing was the provision of widely distributed, proliferated satellite communications incredibly important for a whole host of reasons, including you know, redundant communications ability. Third, a very quick feedback cycle among uh, the Ukrainian government, the United States government, and technology companies to uh, push patches, push updates, and blunt Russian cyber attacks inside Ukraine. It kills me when I, you know, I, I talk to people sometimes and they say, so why weren't there any Russian cyber attacks in Ukraine? It's like, well, there were a lot of Russian cyber attacks in Ukraine. They just didn't work. And they didn't work because of this quick feedback cycle. So I think there are lessons that we can draw on from the recent past uh, to try to prevent kind of analogous problems in, a, in a, a future that we don't want to see, but that we could see. Uh, and, then, and then the last thing is, uh, look, we've heard, we've heard the President of the United States in the last 10 days, we've heard the Secretary of State, we've heard the Secretary of Defense, all reiterating a very clear message uh, in the context of uh, Hamas and Israel, which is uh, a warning to anyone not to try to take advantage of this moment, uh, of, of the chaos and uncertainty of this moment. Um, and I would, I would emphasize that message. Excellent. Thanks for that. You know, you brought up uh, uh, Russia, and, you know, when that gets bred up, you think of oil. You think of energy, and I think if anything uh, that we've learned is that energy, energy security is national security. Wars are begun and are lost because of energy. And um, you know, if you, uh, industry experts say by the year 2050, uh, solar energy is going to uh, represent 50 percent of our energy needs. Now, the good news is that's going to go a long way for our environment, climate change, all of that. Um, the bad news is that those solar panels, eight out of 10 of them are made in China, particularly in the region of Xinjiang, uh, where the two biggest coal-fired power plants in the world are. For those of you who don't know, solar, uh, the manufacturing of solar panels is incredibly energ energy intensive. The amount of energy it takes to build a solar panel is equivalent to the amount of energy it puts out over three years. So they use cheap coal. It's also the area uh, where they use Uyghur slave labor. Um, and, and so if you look at that, it's like, mm, do we want to be dependent on them for our energy uh, needs? And, and 
uh, you know, it was interesting, just like Harvard Business School did a case study on a clean network, Wharton did one on uh, uh, our clean capital markets campaign and focused it on solar. And the question that it left with the students, when you look at investments like from BlackRock and other companies in this whole area of ESG, environment, social governance, it left the que question with the students, should any Chinese companies be considered qualified for ESG? E, they're the biggest polluter in the world. S is social, human rights. This is a regime that commits genocide. And then G, governance. When you think of governance, you think of fiduciary financial responsibility. You can't audit their books. And, and it kind of leaves uh, the students with that question. What are your thoughts on that? Um, how do you balance uh, national security, human rights, the environment? Um, you know, it, uh, my role was, you know, it was, ener it was economic growth, energy, and the environment. And I, you know, those are three knobs to turn. Yeah. I, uh, How do you look at that? I think this is one of those classic complex problems where there are plenty of answers out there that are simple, compelling, and wrong. Um, and the, the un un unfortunately, the real answer is never going to be a clean soundbite on a stage. Um, it's, a, it's a constant series of, you know, compromises, mm -hmm. adjudications. Um, the energy independence in any form gives the United States much greater freedom of action in the world. Um, energy independence that's clean uh, is imperative. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that we are, uh, from a foreign policy standpoint, uh, on the leading edge of, of seeing the incredible changes in the world that climate change is going to bring in terms of migration and impact on vulnerable people mm -hmm. and how that's going to really shift the chessboard in some ways that are going to be profound. Um, so these are, these are the, yeah, the energy independence is a, a, a major calculus, uh, mitigating the worst impacts of climate change and trying to, to minimize uh, mm -hmm. additional temperature rise is, is baked into right. so many things that we're trying to do. Um, but I, I, I uh, again, I, I don't think there's a, there's a simple calculus here. Um, with respect to human rights, uh, I view the, the human rights and digital freedom agenda, uh, which is one of the four offices within my remit, three of them are more technology focused. One is cybersecurity, the second is digital policy, that architecture of the internet, uh, the third is emerging tech, and then there's the human rights and digital freedom piece. I don't view that as a fourth vertical. I think that's the foundation on which everything else mm -hmm. needs to be built. Uh, the, the credibility, the moral authority, the legitimacy, the staying power um, of the United States in the world uh, in any topic, but certainly on this topic, comes from, um, uh, I believe very strongly, that uh, uh, ensuring that all of our policies are or start from a position of bottom-up, organic, inclusive, mm -hmm. rights-respecting development, deployment, and use of yeah. technology. So uh, all of which is to say, I, I don't think there's a perfect answer, yeah. um, but these are, the, these are the considerations that are, yeah. that are involved in every decision. You know, I, I agree with you. And so I looked at it like a Purdue engineer would. I, I'm going, this is an optimization equation. Yeah. And in an optimization equation, there's three things. There's the objective function, that there can only be one. There's the design variables, and then there's constraints. So I looked at it as this. The objective function is national security. Hmm. And then the three design variables are economic growth, energy security, and the health of the planet, because all those affect mm -hmm. national security. Mm -hmm. And then the constraint, well, and this is kind of what you're talking about. Constraint, now that's where you begin talking about human rights, right? Uh, do you want to go above that line? And I'll tell you, that's one of the tough things of being in government. The tough thing about this guy's job is that, you know, uh, they really are optimization equations and, the, and you're tweaking the knobs all the time, trying to do uh, what, what it, what's best for the country. And I, I always look at the, uh, the, the compass, the North Star, you know, uh, it's national security, right? It's protecting these freedoms because democracy is just a 250-year-old experiment. Hmm. 
Um, and you, what I saw, and this is why I, I agree with Nate, anybody who gets a chance to go serve the government, do it because it does require participation. You gotta fight every day for those freedoms and we've never had a more dangerous time uh, in the last 100 years uh, on a, in terms of this threat of freedom. Um, because the natural order thinks the bad king, the dictator and the emperor and terrorists might makes right, so we gotta fight. All right, so let me ask you this, Nate. Uh, what was the question that uh, I didn't ask you that you wish I would have asked you? Basically, you could say anything you want, and, 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 uh, and then you could ask me a question, anything you want. Oh, perfect. But don't make it hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I, I'm going to go first then. I'm going to invoke the prerogative of being in the seat. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I was talking to a handful of students before, uh, before we got started here who came to this event voluntarily during the day, um, and they were curious about the Kroc Institute and, and what exactly is the Institute and what is it doing here at Purdue? Yeah. And I'm not sure we've actually talked about that. Yeah, so uh, as I met, thank you for asking that question, man. That was not planted. Of all the questions way. I would yeah. want, it would definitely be that one, I might add. Uh, so as I mentioned, our North Star is technology must advance freedom and the Kroc Institute was founded when Mung and I came out of uh, office. And uh, one of the big major purposes is this area of tech diplomacy uh, that we kind of invented and took it to the next level. And when it's used as an instrument of power, it becomes tech statecraft. Uh, we wanted, uh, we, we need to train people, uh, not only diplomats around the world, but businesses around the world. And so we're working with Nate in terms of training the United States State Department, Commerce Department. We're working with our allies and friends, uh, like in Japan and Sweden. So that's a big component of it. And we've got a great world-class uh, education team. These were the leaders from uh, edX, which is the top platform in online learning. So it comes in bite-sized modular uh, chunks. Uh, so that's one of the, uh, that's one of the big initiatives. You know, the other big one, obviously, is we've been asked to lead the Global Tech Security Commission. And that, the, the charter for that is to develop the Global Tech Security Strategy uh, for the free world. And I mentioned there's 50 commissioners. Each one of those commissioners probably has eight to 10 advisory council members. So now you're talking about 500 people. And, you know, people support, they help create. It probably will become that de facto standard. And, and that's something that's tough for a government to do tough for a company to do. Um, and then along with that is the operationalizing of it and this global trusted tech network. Um, and if you look at, at, at the implications for that, and we've modeled it very much after the clean network, which said any, any country, any company uh, can join this. You just have to pledge to live and your behavior has to show that you have to live by these basic principles of integrity and accountability and transparency, respect for rule of law, property, all that. Um, and if you don't, need not apply. And that, uh, you know, the, the clean network represented two thirds of the world's global GDP. And when that class was being taught uh, at Harvard, there was a few Chinese students in there and a professor asked China, well, what do you think that means for uh, China? He, and he, he, he gave a thought I never thought about before. He goes, that's put China in a catch-22 because they have a choice. They can either change their laws or reform their behavior or they're shut out of two-thirds of, of the market. But it's their choice. Um, and so anyway, that's a, that's a big um, initiative that we have uh, as well. We also have uh, our trusted tech partner, finance thing that we're doing for low income nations for, to close the digital divide, particularly uh, in the area of economic empowerment of women. This is one of the things I saw in the State Department, such a big need. And so these are communities where people are living on less than $2 a day. And our objective is to put technology in their hands for a penny a day. And we're working with the biggest um, uh, issuer of microloans in the world, Opportunity International, we've been around for um, a long time. Um, and so really trying to get that in their hands. So uh, there's a number of initiatives. 
but right here at Purdue, I think, is the perfect place to have it. Because one of the other things we're doing, put together a certification for trusted technology. And, um, and I think it's one of the uh, key pillars to produce, um, you know, top national security status. So thanks for asking that question. I probably rambled a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's your prerogative, not at all. It's a really important initiative. And uh, I really second the, uh, the importance of Purdue's leadership position on this. I hope other universities will look at what you're doing here. And uh, a little imitation is uh, the sincerest form of flattery. Um, maybe the one thing that I, I would add, uh, somehow we, we, uh, we've managed to spend about an hour up here talking about tech diplomacy, and we haven't said the words uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and that's another uh, big vector of our work right now, and um, I've been impressed here to learn a little bit more about what's happening in yeah. the curriculum with majors, AI majors in the philosophy department and yeah. computer science and different uh, um, interdisciplinary approaches to this, which is really cool. Um, the, uh, the approach that we're taking in the US um, has been to ensure that our innovative advantage remains our North Star. Uh, so when ChatGPT was released about a year ago and it captured popular attention all over the world, every government in the world said, we gotta do something. Uh, nobody really had a good answer of what to do. So um, the, the United States has been working with seven and then 15, an, an expanding group of the leading companies to develop a set of voluntary commitments that the companies will sign up to in the areas of safety, security, and trust. And uh, voluntary matters because it's fast. Uh, it's a starting point. It's not the end of the governance framework, but it's the beginning. Uh, and it's a quick start. Uh, so voluntary matters because it's fast. It matters because voluntary, by definition, isn't going to constrain innovation. And so having arrived at this pretty robust set of guidelines of yeah. commitments with the companies now, uh, we're working to multilateralize them to get them adopted um, uh, by as many of our allies and partners as yeah. we can. And that's, uh, yeah, that, that's a big part of the of things we're doing here in terms of that certification and bringing in, yeah. our, like NATO, right? We're, how we're working with that. Well, I think our time is up, but I wanna say one thing to this uh, crowd here. I couldn't imagine a better inaugural ambassador of cybersecurity and tech diplomacy than, than Nate. He is a true patriot. And um, I mean, and I can't thank you enough for your service. You're a great Marine. We, we are honored uh, that you're on our advisory council, the uh, honorary co-chair of the Global Tech Security Commission. And it's just been a pleasure working with you. And I think you're gonna set the example for many years to come for your predecessors. And I know you're gonna do everything to maintain continuity of policy. So let's give a big round of applause for Nate Beck on that. Day. Thank you, Keith. I really appreciate the generosity. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>